we say there are more ways of killing a cat than drowning it in butter. If we uh, return from the logic books to real life, we find that things which must undoubtedly be called statements are very seldom describable as just true or just false, very often not describable as true or false at all, and yet they're undoubtedly statements. And this will mean, you see, that the little speciality which was to discriminate statements from performative utterance collapses. In fact, we find that we are using a very similar large array of labels of appraisal in comparing both forms of utterance with the fact. I'll give one or two examples of things that are undoubtedly statements which cannot be said to be true or false. One is this example, France is hexagonal. Another is Lord Raglan won the Battle of Alma. There are many others. Supposing somebody were to say, well, now, I wonder if it's true that Lord Raglan won the Battle of Alma or that France is hexagonal. We realize, of course, from the very start, uh, not merely, of course, that the utterance is in some way to be confronted with the facts, but also that there isn't going to be any answer of the true or false form. Supposing we confront France is hexagonal with the facts, I suppose, with France. Is it true or is it not? Well, if you like, up to a point. Of course, I can see what you mean. For certain intents and purposes, certainly. Good enough for a top-ranking general, perhaps, but not for a geographer. Naturally, it's pretty rough. We should say pretty rough and pretty good as a pretty rough statement. But then one says, but is it true or is it false? I don't find whether it's rough. Of course it's rough. But it has to be true or false, it's a statement, isn't it? Well, but how can one answer the question whether it's true or false that France is hexagonal? It's just rough. And that is the right and final answer to the question of the relationship of France is hexagonal to France. It is a rough description. It isn't a true one or a false one. And so with uh, Lord Raglan and the Battle of Alma. Alma, in case you didn't know, why should you, was what we call a soldier's battle, if ever there was one. Well, of course, Lord Raglan was in command. Ordinarily, he was in command of the British, though not of the French, and the French were supposed to do what the British indicated they would like them to do, and to a minor extent possibly did so. It happens to be true that none of Lord Raglan's orders were ever transmitted. Well, did he win the Battle of Alma? Not, of course, in some context. It's perfectly justifiable to say so. Well, something of an exaggeration, maybe. Of course, if any question of giving the old fool a medal for it, that's rather a different matter. One wouldn't want to dwell on his having won the battle in that case. Really, the fact is this. When we talk of true and false, we haven't got what people too readily suppose a couple of labels for two simple contradictory properties, one of which every statement possesses, we have rather a very abstract label for a whole dimension of assessment of these utterances, exactly as we have in the case of the performative. If we really go into the matter of the relation of uh, statements to facts, and if we do not restrict ourselves, as people too often do, to assertions which are idiotically simple or ideally simple, then we soon find that we cannot disentangle some simple truth and simple falsity from considerations of what is fair or equitable or exaggerated or precise or general or rough and the like. Well, I'll stop at this point simply saying that we find we have to think again about this alleged contrast between performative and constative. And uh, the result, I think, of further reflection on the matter would be that we don't want to divide utterances into two classes, uh, the effect of which is to give stating a peculiar, isolated preeminence, which it doesn't really deserve, what we want to realize is that when I issue an utterance, 
there is always the question what speech act I was performing in issuing it. One of such possible speech acts is, for example, stating, which is only one of a family of cognate speech acts, including describing, reporting, and so forth, which are not all the same. But this whole family, callable by the name of uh, constating, is itself only one of a vast array of further families um, in and among which will be found such acts as warning, threatening, ordering, advising, even apologizing, all the kinds of acts which we said were typically performed when a performative utterance was issued. Stating, we discover, is only one in a huge array of possible speech acts, in a certain sense of that expanded term, among which warning, threatening, and so on will occur. What we, do, we don't want any longer a division of utterances into two. What we want instead is something much more difficult to get, a classification by families and with criteria of all the possible kinds of speech act, in this sense of speech act, that we perform in issuing utterances.